Okay, are we live? <clears throat> All right. Welcome, everybody, to today's event, uh, hosted generously by the Moore Tara Center for International Studies at Georgetown University. My name is Josh Rogan. I'm a columnist with the Washington Post. And today we're here to talk about war crimes and atrocities in Syria and Ukraine and the emerging and uh, active Syria-Ukraine network. Um, you know, when it comes to Russia, the term war crimes is redundant. This is the Russian way of war. Under Vladimir Putin, attacking civilian populations through collective punishment, using starvation as a weapon of war, mass murder of civilians, mass torture, rape and abuse of civilians in custody and POWs and is the rule, not the exception. Uh, but for those watching these atrocities in Ukraine, uh, they're slowly but surely realizing that this is the, the way that Russia has been waging war in Syria for over 12 years. And the, with its partners in Iran and the Assad regime, uh, they've created a systematic pattern of war crimes and crimes against humanity and other mass atrocities that are joining together, not just the criminals, but having an effect by uh, joining together the victims as well. And that's what we're here to discuss today, how the victims of Russia, Russian atrocities are pooling their resources and their information uh, to work together, to help each other, to fight the common enemy and to seek accountability and justice. And we couldn't have a better panel than we do today. Uh, first of all, we have via Zoom, Oleksandra Matvichuk, who leads the Center for Civil Liberties, a Kyiv-based human rights organization that was <coughs> awarded the 2022 Nobel Peace Prize. Ambassador Stephen Rapp, the former US ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Office of Criminal Justice. Retired Colonel Yegevni Vindman, who uh, you may know from his uh, story of being fired from the Trump White House after he raised concerns about President Trump's Ukraine con uh, conduct, but he's actually much more than the event that made him famous. He's an expert on international and humanitarian law and has been active on the ground in Ukraine. And Muaz Mustafa, the executive director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force and one of the founders of the Syria-Ukraine network. Um, what we're, I'd love to start with you, Alexandra. Can you hear us? Alexandra. Can you hear us? I think we need to unmute her. Uh, let's unmute her. That'll just take a second. Please stand by. <laughs> Test so you can hear you for the first time, so you can tell. Oh, well, hi, Alexandra. Can you hear us? Video as well, so you can see. Testing. Well, Alexandra, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up or a wave. Yes, you can hear us. Okay. <laughs> can we hear you? Can we make the voice, the sound? Okay. Well, uh, that's actually good. You yes, did, I you hear see? you well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're back in business. So <laughs> luckily you were not able to hear me mispronounce your name, but I want to welcome you to our panel and congratulate you on your work and ask you an opening question. And if you could just, first of all, give our audience uh, an update on the status of uh, the drive for accountability and justice for war crimes inside Ukraine. Tell us the latest of what's going on on the ground. It's a huge honor for me to be a president of this panel. My name is Alexander Matvichuk. I'm human rights defender, head of Center for Civil Liberties. We have been documenting war crimes for eight years already, and since the large-scale Russian invasion, we united our efforts with other human rights organizations, mostly regional swan in one tribunal for Putin initiative. We created the unique all-Ukrainian network of local documentators, 
and working together only for eight months of Russian aggression, we have been documented 21,000 of uh, war crimes. It's very different uh, kinds of uh, war crimes. Among them, deliberate shelling on residential buildings, churches, schools, hospitals. Uh, among them, attacks, uh, deliberate attacks to recreation corridors or to the attempts uh, to break encirclement with humanitarian systems. The, among them, murders, tortures, kidnapping, uh, extrajudicial killings, and sexual violence against civilians on the occupied territories. So I can conclude my introductory speech with those facts that Russia uses war crimes as a method of warfare. Russia tries to break people's resistance uh, and occupy the country by the tool which I call the immense pain of civilians. And we document this pain and parallel, we are searching for a complex strategy of justice, how to bring all perpetrators Accountable. Thank you so much. Let, uh, let me follow up with you by asking you directly about some of your work with uh, Syrian organizations and with some of the Syrian victims of Russia's atrocities. Can you give us some examples of how that cooperation has manifested itself in Ukraine and what have you learned and what have you uh, been able to accomplish by pooling information and resources? with the Syrian victims. We are very grateful for Syrian human rights defenders, uh, not only for their professional assistance and cooperation, but also for the very sincere and human solidarity support. I remember that oh, what, two days before large-scale invasion, I received the letter from my colleague uh, from Syria Human Rights Organization with the words of support, and immediately after a large invasion started, I received the letter with uh, the words that we are with you, and please tell what everything which we can to do to support you will do. I'm very grateful. Like uh, this war has a value dimension. It's not only the war like between two states; it's a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. And I strongly believe that we have to support each other. And I will conclude the answer to this question with an important point, which also unites Ukraine and Syria human rights defenders, because all this how which we're going on through in this war now, it's a result of total impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades. Russia committed war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Syria, in Mali, in Libya in Georgia, in other countries of the world. And they have never been punished for that. They have avoided uh, the responsibility even for using chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. So it's led to a situation that Russians start to think that they can do whatever they wanted. And we have to unite <coughs> our efforts and break the circle of impunity. Thank you. One more, let me ask you one more question before I move on. Uh, one of the more recent developments is the appearance of Iranian equipment, but also <coughs> Iranian personnel on the battlefield in Ukraine. Um, can you talk about the Iranian role in the Russian uh, assault, specifically in some of the atrocities and war crimes that we've seen, and what your organization is saying on the ground? Yes, it's very good examples how authoritarian regimes cooperate with each other. And it's one more proof, uh, not spoke, speaking about only Ukrainian uh, issue, but generally that the whole international system of peace and security allays in ruins because uh, for decades the voice of human rights defenders wasn't heard. Uh, maybe we was heard in the uh, UN Committee on Human Rights or, or HDM OEC, but not in the premises and in the rooms where decisions were taking place. And this uh, also a good um, and bright example that there is an inevitable connection between peace and security and human rights, uh, uh, peace and security and human rights, because human rights is a 
solid ground to take a political decision uh, and on the level as economical stability or military potential. And states who provide um, injustice and who severely violate their own human rights responsibilities towards their own citizens is a threat not only to their own citizens, but to the whole world. And with this uh, example of Iran cooperation with Russia, now it's become um, uh, very difficult for Ukraine, especially because one of tactics of Russia is deliberate dis uh, destroying of critical civil infrastructure. And in, we uh, documented only for three months uh, the 271 episodes uh, which uh, of heating the different kind of uh, uh, power plants and other civil uh, objects uh, in throughout Ukraine in order to uh, deprive uh, civilians uh, without water, electricity, heating, light, <coughs> etc. And even today, I have no guarantee that I will be able to join to this panel because we have like problem with electricity. So now uh, Iran provides more opportunity to Russia to continue these terrorist attacks against civilians because they sold uh, Iranian drone and rockets to Russia and do it uh, like publicly. And it has to be a joint response of civilized world to such kind of action. Thank you so much. And we'll, we're going to talk about the response in the next round of questions. So please stay put and we'll come back to you. Thank you so much. Let me now turn to you, Ambassador Rapp. Uh, when we talk about accountability and justice, it can be a very long process, but it begins at the moment that the crime is committed. Can you explain to us what are the similarities between uh, the paths for accountability and justice in Syria and in Ukraine, and what are some of the differences and challenges that make the most recent conflict unique? Well, it's, it's on, also an honor for me to be here, and, and, and thank you for, for that question. And let me just begin by saying that, uh, that I agree uh, very strongly with uh, what Alexandra just said about impunity uh, between the Syria and, and, and Russian uh, um, Ukrainian situations, uh, because what we've seen is, is Russia getting away with murder for years and years and years and, and never being held to account. Uh, and the tremendous involvement of, of Russia in Syria, uh, in the targeting of civilians and hospitals, and even explicitly of bombing hospitals and cheering when they were, uh, when they were destroyed with, with ill and dying people in them. And then uh, uh, additionally, the, uh, we have these crimes now uh, in, in Ukraine and, and impunity breeds, breeds impunity. And, and that's why it's so important uh, that we hold these perpetrators to account. Uh, I will say that we've learned a lot in Syria uh, in terms of the importance of documenting the crimes. Uh, it's not what you think, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And, and uh, quite often the strongest evidence is available very early in, in the conflict, right at the scene of that crime. And there's also needs to be work done in terms of connecting those crimes uh, in the field uh, to the high level actors that, that, that have made them happen. And it was eventually possible to do that in Syria. I mean, it's not adequate. There's no national prosecutor in Syria that's obviously gonna prosecute these cases under the regime as, as there certainly is a prosecutor in Ukraine that's able to prosecute these things. So there is that difference. Uh, but uh, the, in the, both situations, you really need this intense effort to build the evidence and to connect the dots. And it's, and it's not, it's important, of course, to prosecute all the perpetrators. I was interviewed last week in a story with Alexandra where she talked about the importance of prosecuting every case. And, and, and that's what, I, what, what we'd like to see. But the most important cases are those of the high level actors that are making it happen. They're not of the conscript that doesn't even know he's going into Ukraine uh, at, at the beginning of the conflict, but who may do horrible things and should be prosecuted for it. We need to, we need to lead up uh, to, to the top. And so in, in both situations, uh, it's been possible uh, to collect that evidence, uh, but it does involve a, a complex process. Now, uh, for instance, today uh, we have the issuance of the UN report, the Commission of Inquiry report, uh, uh, that was issued uh, pursuant to a mandate of the Human Rights Council, which the UN, uh, US strongly supported, uh, chaired by a Norwegian judge, also with a Colombian and, and Bosnian member of the commission with an independent international staff. And of course, it's extremely important in, in pointing out uh, 
uh, that this is neutral. It's not one side or another. It's not a NATO document or a U.S. document or a Russian document. And, and clearly it finds these massive violations of the laws of war, particularly in the indiscriminate use of major bombardment that has had such an enormous effect on the civilian population, damaging civilian infrastructure, residential buildings, schools, hospitals, etc. But it also points to the to the interpersonal and the violent crimes that we've seen evidence of in places like Busha or more, most recently in Izium. And it's in those places where you have the real challenge of connecting the dots between the field and, and the high level actors. Uh, because the, what happens in these trials, having prosecuted the Rwanda and Sierra Leone courts, is the leaders always say, I didn't have anything to do with it. Those were misbehaving soldiers that I knew nothing about and couldn't control. And of course, building that evidence, and it is possible to do that, to, uh, collecting the information at the scene, all of the documents that are often left behind, the pocket trash in the, in the, in the pockets of the dead soldiers, the, the markings on the wall, the interceptions that have occurred, the other kind of ways in which uh, neighbors have, have taken photos of, of the scene and seen the, which units have moved through and at which point. And, and doing that, we can build these cases up to the highest level. And that's what it's been possible to do in the Syrian context and what it will be so necessary to do uh, here in, 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 in the Russian one. Of course, at the end of the day, we have the challenge of getting people in custody. In the, in the Syrian context, that's a matter of, of finding people that are traveling abroad and, and, uh, and prosecuting them in third countries or using the jurisdiction of third countries whose citizens have been uh, impacted or injured <clears throat> or killed uh, to get jurisdiction in the third countries. Here, there's the potential. I've got the list of current war crimes prosecutions in the Ukrainian system uh, to prosecute prisoners of war, sometimes officers that have captured, and that you can then, if you've got this evidence, attribute to them the role that they play in the torture, in the killing, in the sexual violence, in the indiscriminate attacks. And so it's important that they be able to proceed with these cases, but that we build the, the stronger file against those that they don't yet hold and against the highest level right up to Vladimir Putin. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, before I go on, let me just ask you one quick follow-up question. How can the documentary collection of uh, evidence of war crimes and atrocities in Syria aid the cases in Ukraine and vice versa? Can we use the these these huge pools of information to, together to in ways that can hold the perpetrators accountable in the cases that where the perpetrators are the same people? Well, there, there are possibilities, uh, frankly, of, of, of joint cases, mm. of cases that involve the same kind of individuals. Uh, for instance, we now have this new uh, leader who's known for his immense brutality, who's, who's become the commander in the field, uh, uh, General Sorovican. Uh, and uh, he was, of course, responsible for so much of the brutal operation against the civilian population, against hospitals, against humanitarian relief, against every, every, every human value and every law that there is in Syria, and as a result, He's promoted, and he's now presiding over this, uh, uh, what they seem to, frankly, uh, I think are proof that this is, goes beyond indiscriminate to intentional, and indeed I think we've got proof of intention already, but there's no question that what's happening now is an intentional response to the attack on the Crimean Bridge, and, and they're doing something that's totally against the laws of war. They're attacking civilian infrastructure. They're trying to turn out the lights, turn out the heat, make it impossible for people to be operated on in, 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 opera, in, in hospitals, causing uh, people to, uh, to freeze to death or, or to suffer illness if they're, if, if they're already disabled or elderly, et cetera, and, or death. I mean, these are exactly prohibited, and that's been, been, been the tactic uh, since, uh, since he became commander in chief. Well, he can be held responsible for crimes in Syria right now. He can be cases that in, in which uh, dual nationals have been killed can be attributed to him. He could be actually prosecuted in a third country at the moment, even before he's prosecuted in Ukraine. And if people Great are idea. captured on the field, uh, uh, pilots that were involved in the use of chemical weapons, there was one pilot that was arrested uh, earlier and held that, that was later exchanged that had involved in 150 uh, combat uh, flying uh, sorties, so to speak, in Syria. He was exchanged? Uh, he was exchanged. I think they got a lot of people for him. <laughs> okay. It does happen. I, don't want to judge it. I mean, I'd like to hold on to guys like that and exchange a few others, to right. be frank. But uh, there are others that are that are becoming available. Uh, but persons like that could be charged immediately in Germany, in France, et cetera, and, and prosecuted for their crimes in Syria, sent back to Ukraine, and prosecuted once the case is built for their crimes in, in, in Ukraine. So I see these opportunities to to work together to get justice sooner rather than later. 
Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, Colonel Vindman, let me go to you. You spent so many years uh, working on these issues, both uh, in the military and as a and and even now. And one of the projects that I know that you're involved in is a State Department effort, which is called the Atrocity Crimes Prevention Group. And I was wondering if I could just start by asking you. Well, I mean, I guess it doesn't seem like they're preventing the atrocities, but I know that they're doing a lot of work to document and 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 deal with the atrocities. Can you talk about what they're doing in Ukraine and then, of course, whatever uh, observations you have from your recent trips there? I know you've been there a lot doing uh, uh, collecting evidence to the ground. So um, it's an honor to be here uh, amongst uh, a really august group, uh, including a Nobel laureate, former ambassador, and my colleague here. Um, so it's the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, we're not uh, charged with preventing it. Oh, okay. So I, uh, maybe we could there is another one called the yes. Atrocity Crimes Prevention Group. I got those screwed up. That was my error. Uh, but no worries. So um, in May, uh, the uh, foreign minister for the EU, uh, UK, and um, the Secretary of State announced the formation of the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. Got it. And it's a multilateral group uh, charged with uh, supporting the Ukrainian prosecutor general with investigating and prosecuting war crimes. And um, it's a group of international experts. We actually have a Croatian prosecutor. We have a German prosecutor. Uh, we have a former ambassador and predecessor to uh, Ambassador Rapp, uh, Ambassador Clint Williamson, that's our lead. And um, we've had three trips, or I personally had three trips uh, into Ukraine. There have been other trips to Poland before that even. And we're working uh, very closely with the uh, prosecutor general's office and my particular uh, charge, given my expertise and, and background, working on topics like interna international humanitarian law, international criminal court, um, is uh, to assist the military analysis cell in, to, in the interagency working group. So to the extent that you're looking at uh, crimes of indiscriminate attack, uh, there is a cell, for instance, that uh, has uh, military experts, uh, Ukrainian generals and artillery officers to determine uh, what kind of system was fired uh, at, at what time and what damage it did, a crater analysis, very impressive actually effort um, in the technical sense using seismologies. Um, uh, so in that regard, I think they're, they're pretty well advanced. But in the sense that these are ultimately civilian prosecutors that are now been thrown into uh, investigating and prosecuting war crimes, uh, there is uh, a need to educate um, what the uh, what is a war crime because the Ukrainians will look at anything, anything that involves a death, including a death of a soldier, as a potentially a war crime. And so, uh, an education process with Ukrainian prosecutors and um, the Ukrainian military, the prosecutor generals office prioritizing the number of cases. Um, Alexandra mentioned 22,000 that she has um, documented. There are over 33,000 open cases, actually, wow. and that was about a month ago. And that was before the recent uh, spate of, of bombings. And I, I can, uh, from my own personal perspective, I've seen the uh, acceleration of uh, indiscriminate or really um, Indiscriminate attacks, certainly in, in Kharkiv, uh, but also um, targeted attacks on infrastructure. So things that the ambassador mentioned, dams, power regeneration facilities, um, uh, basic life support, uh, water treatment facilities. And so at this point, uh, over 30 percent of um, power generation in Ukraine is uh, has been down or has been knocked out. And uh, there's a significant uh, possibility that there will be a second round of, of uh, refugee flow back as we turn into winter. Um, there have been several million people fled, um, about half that number, so over a million, almost two million have returned, and many of them will leave again if the infrastructure is the, not there during the winter to support life. Um, so the, the work is critically important. Um, uh, the Ukrainians are fully capable uh, in many regards with handling it. The difficulty is the scope and uh, managing the scope and prioritizing all of the, the functions. Thank you so much. Uh, Moaz, let me go to you. Uh, the Syria-Ukraine network, that's a thing that didn't exist before the Ukraine war, but in the 
my understanding is in the eight months since the invasion, it has there's been a lot of collaboration on the ground. Uh, I know you've been deeply involved in that. Tell us some of the specifics of how Syrians and Ukrainians are working uh, inside Ukraine and uh, what, what are the lessons learned from that experience so far? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I want to say it really is an exceptional honor to be on such a distinguished panel, Colonel Vinman, Ambassador Rapp, um, and, and Alexandra, who we hope to have you here in Washington in person because everybody in the House, Senate, White House should hear from you directly. And, and thank you, Josh, for, for moderating this panel. Um, and thanks to Georgetown as well for this space. But I, I want to also thank Olga Lotman, the coordinator for the Syria Ukraine Network, who helped put all of this together. Um, and, and her work has been key to all of this. I want to say that the coordination and cooperation between Syrians and Ukrainians predates this latest re-invasion of Ukraine. The invasion of Ukraine happened in 2014 when they annexed Crimea, and it was at that time that we were just reeling in Syria from the lack of action after the red line uh, speech and the use of chemical weapons on a massive scale. Um, it was at that time that I met with you know, Ukrainian friends like Andrea Chalupa, the Ukrainian Americans and others, um, and we would advocate at least you know, here in the halls of power and to the general public about what's happening. In 2015, Russia comes in in full force. It was another time where Ukrainians and Syrians worked together to highlight the crimes and what the Russian military was capable of. But most recently with this renewed massive invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, you know, it was it was really tough. It was tough talking, you know, me being here in Washington, talking to both Syrians and Ukrainians. The Syrians on the ground, everybody I spoke with wanted to help in any way they can. Many of them wanted to even go, men, women, children, every, people wanted to go and help fight defend you, to defend Ukraine. And I thought that was really inspirational. Um, sounds crazy. It's a country in the Middle East. You know, I don't know how much, you know, people had known people from the Ukraine, but that solidarity was palpable at the same time. It was Ukrainians that were calling us um, as well, uh, including our office um, here at the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and saying, you know, did you guys know they were this, you know, inhumane, the kind of crimes, the kind of targeting that was happening? You know, it's a shock to us when Ukraine is, is on the border with Russia, their neighbors, but the Syrians knew very well how horrific um, uh, the Russian military can be. And so the Syrian Ukraine network, within weeks of that sort of re invasion, came together. Um, and uh, with the leadership of Olga, includes Syrian uh, and Ukrainian organizations and individuals on the ground uh, and in the diaspora, working on number one, countering the misinformation, the amount of propaganda and misinformation that comes out of the Russian military and its allies, including Iran. And as Alexandra said, they're all on the same team is massive. And we saw that with the white helmets. We saw that with the chemical weapons attacks, where they said the Syrians gassed like, their own children, et cetera. Um, uh, and we see that in Ukraine. Um, we also, in terms of war crimes documentation, and Ambassador Rapp really shown a lot of light on this, but the fact is that there's so much uh, overlapping that there's a lot of ways to help. And so all of the files that the Syrians have documented or retained on past or current um, or future potential Russian war crimes in Syria, um, uh, you know, that's something that Syria Ukraine Network has been working on and pushing towards sort of integrating these databases to ensure that we have uh, whoever is prosecuting has has access to all of it. And, you know, and so a soldier, a Russian, you know, soldier or officer in Ukraine may have not killed a kid in Ukraine yet, but he may have done so in Syria and if captured should be held accountable. Um, also, when it comes to medical aid, um, you know, the fact is Syrian doctors have been working under Russian bombardments, Russian missiles. Uh, forever, uh, and Sierra Ukraine Network helped, uh, working with the Syrian American Medical Society, another member of Sierra Ukraine Network, helped send uh, over $400,000 of medical equipment to Ukraine, but more importantly, doctors that knew how to operate under these horrific circumstances. And, to, and so to see, first of all, the inspirational defense of Ukraine by its people uh, against an overwhelming odds and in all of that, that continues to inspire the world. Uh, is just as inspirational to me as the fact that the Syrians who have been left alone under these horrific war crimes were probably some of the most helpful people as just regular people fighting against these horrific uh, war criminals. Uh, and so these are a few examples of, of many others that the Syria Ukraine Network has come together, uh, both in terms of war crimes documentation, countering propaganda, and resisting uh, the Russian military and occupation in general. Thank you, Moaz. Now we see, I'm not sure, I'm sure if you can see it online, we can't see it online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> actual evidence of actual war crimes in vivid, detailed color 
Moaz, can you take us through these images and tell our audience what it is you, you were, were witnessing here? Absolutely. First of all, um, I want to mention, uh, and, and Josh knows these amazing individuals very well, uh, and they're individuals that I think about uh, that, that are like Alexandra, people on the ground taking great risks to their lives to bring out documentation of war crimes, whether it's Caesar, the military defector with almost 55,000 photos of men, women, children, and elderly that have been tortured to death, or people that worked in the mass grave system uh, that Russia was very well aware of. Many victims of Russian crimes are buried in these, uh, in these mass graves alongside uh, Iranian and Assad regime victims. Um, and, and, and a person that we call the grave digger, another sort of witness, um, uh, brought forward information that showed the mass graves in Syria. First of all, I want to remind people, since we are here in Washington, D.C., that um, you can't see it on the camera, but over there, there is uh, five pictures of Americans that have been detained in Syria. We know some of them have been tortured to death. Uh, we don't know about what happened to others. And those that have survived are now pursuing uh, prosecutions, at least civil cases against the Assad regime. Uh, but these mass graves that we see here um, are mass graves that we recently identified that show where hundreds of thousands of victims of Russia's air force, the Assad regime, his military, and Iranian-backed militias were buried. You can see in the first photo, there is undisturbed ground. This is north of Damascus in the 3rd Armored Division's base. But this is a massive area. Um, so uh, the next photo, you see these massive trenches uh, that, are, that are there. Uh, and in these trenches are seven meters deep, three, seven, three meters wide, and extend sometimes to 200 meters in length. Uh, and here you see, uh, you know, as more trenches are dug, this is enough for, um, you know, going back in terms of the area and the amount of the mass graves, the hundreds of thousands of victims. And finally, here uh, uh, we see the bulldozer driver in, in massive trucks that are carrying men, women, children, elderly, innocent civilians to be dumped in these mass graves. Uh, by the way, this last photo also shows a giant wall that was built around this massive mass grave location and Russian military vehicles that were placed at the dirt roads that go towards that mass grave. We don't know exactly what the function of those vehicles are. Um, and of course, we know that all the military hardware of the Assad regime is Russian supplied and, and, and Russia continues to occupy Syria and Assad is a puppet of theirs. But this one is after the witness, the grave digger, uh, testified in Koblenz, uh, a case that has now led to the life sentence of a head of an intelligence branch in Syria. Um, and after that testimony, you can see that the regime is here, I don't know, attempting and failing, of course, to hide one of its many mass graves. But that is the legacy and the continued work of Russia in Syria. And this is why, as Alexandra said, it's being allowed to happen in Ukraine. And the fact is, we all must work together. It's both in the U.S.'s best you know, national interest and out of its allies, and it's the right thing to do, to do everything we can to support the people both in Syria and Ukraine to defend against these Russian, um, this Russian military and its um, proxies. Thank you, Moaz. We're going to save some time at the end for questions, so those of us in the live audience, come up with some good questions. Think about it. Do you have a few minutes? Because I want to do one more round of questions uh, of my own with the panelists, but get your questions ready. Uh, Oh, Sandra, can you still hear us? <coughs> Excellent, thank you. I would. Um, can you see these uh, these photos on your screen? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, when you hear these stories about mass graves and mass atrocities in Syria, how does that compare to the stories and the and the and the evidence and the examples that you're seeing on the ground in Ukraine? Do you see patterns that repeat themselves? Do you see specific examples of the tactics used? Yes, it's the same patterns. Uh, when I was myself uh, with a part of my team in Kiev, and Russian troops started to circle to Kiev, and when they retreat, uh, we sent mobile groups to Bucha, Matizhan, Borza, Lepini, and other cities and settlements. We found that there are torture chambers, mass graves, the dead bodies of people lay scattered around the streets and also in the gardens of their own households. So, like now in September, when the Ukrainian army liberated Kharkiv region, we see the same patterns. And exactly the same as I know from my colleague from Syria happened there. Uh, like that's why we take very serious the advice of our Syrian colleague because they told us uh, at the beginning of large-scale invasion, don't put their label children 
on the object because Russians will deliberately hit these objects. Don't put the label uh, hospital or medics uh, on the some object because Russians deliberately attack such kind of objects. So we uh, suffered from the same patterns of war crimes and the same cruel policy of conducting the war. But we are strong uh, of cooperating and to help each other how to cope with such patterns. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you directly, uh, what can we do to help? What can Western governments do? What can people in free and open societies do? What do you need right now? And uh, what is the, what, tell us how, how we can best help you and the people that you're helping. Democracies can do a lot, and once again, it's uh, the civilization battle where Ukraine now is a temporary or front between authoritarian and democracy. Putin is fight with a democracy, with a freedom, with a rule of law in general, and in the value dimension of the work, he tried to uh, convince people that these values are, are fake values because they couldn't protect anyone. So we need support from uh, democracies in order to prove that democracy, freedom, rule of law has no limitation in state borders, and this is a working co concept. And I will tell about justice because we need justice, we need to break the circle of impunity, and we need to change our paradigm of thinking. Uh, what do I mean? In 20th century, the civilized world provided a, a very essential step to establish law and justice. And in the Nuremberg trials, the Nazi war criminal were tried after Nazi regime had collapsed. But when we in 21st century, we must move further. Justice must be independent of the magnitude of Putin's regime power. We cannot wait. We have to establish international tribunal now and hold Putin, Lukashenko and other war criminals accountable. This is very important. And also practically, when we speak about short-term impact, we, Ukraine needs support in all dimensions, in military dimension, like we need air defense systems and some concrete kinds of weapons to be able to defend uh, not only territory, but first of all, people who live on these territories. Also, we need a unity in economical field. Uh, Russia with destroying energy plants, We're fighting not only with Ukraine, but fighting with the West, because Ukraine produces a lot of energy to, okay, maybe not a lot, I'm not competent in this field, but one was one of produce, like exporter of energy to European Union. And like uh, with this heating, uh, Putin stopped uh, electricity not only in Ukraine, but tried to reach uh, uh, European Union as well. So uh, what do I mean? That we are expecting a very hard winter, like generally, not only in Ukraine. Uh, but we have not uh, to, to go to this black mail and to uh, make some concessions, which Putin demands with such a terroristic act. We need to stand united and support each other to survive this hard winter. Thank you, thank you. Ambassador Rapp, when it comes to the some of the ideas that Alexander has laid out, what are the policy obstacles? What are the things that are preventing some of these things from happening? And what can specifically the US government, but also other uh, governments and free and open societies, what, what can they do that they're not doing already? If, well, you, if you were yeah, I mean, indeed. I mean, one, uh, and we've heard about the good work that we're doing with the prosecutors uh, through the ACA. I mean, additional work needs to be provided to the Ukrainian National Police and the Security Police. I mean, they have hundreds of thousands of uh, phones, uh, hard drives, other documents that haven't been analyzed yet that are really essential to build the cases, the linkage, so that they're not the 21-year-old soldier killing the 62-year-old guy on the street. Those are horrible crimes. But we want to reach the guy who sent the 21-year-old in there and trained him and told him to do these kinds of things. So how do we put that kind of thing together? That's, that's really essential. So we want to strengthen to the maximum extent possible the ability of the Ukrainians to do these cases themselves. Secondly, in terms of the International Criminal Court, 
Uh, the ICC does have jurisdiction. There's confusion. People say it has to go to the Security Council first. No, not in this situation. They accepted the jurisdiction. 43 countries in the ICC moved it before the prosecutor. The prosecutor could indict Putin tomorrow. Mm. Now, we want the prosecutor to be careful. Mm. Uh, there have been times when things have moved uh, too quickly. And indeed, when you get to these crimes like Busha and Izium and tracing up the chain and showing everything else, that's very complicated. But particularly with these operations that are occurring right now, as Colonel Vindman said, the targeting of, of infrastructure necessary to civilian survival as a matter of national policy, talked about in, in, in Putin's own speeches, I think we've got direct proof of something that he has ordered and caused to be happening and that he's going to continue to do. It's not helping his war, by the way. He's still losing in Kyrgyzstan. He's losing at the battlefield. These aren't military targets. It's, 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 it's terror. He's trying to terrorize the civilian population. Frankly, that didn't work in London. It hasn't worked in other wars in the past. I mean, it's just the way to, 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 to make people die and suffer uh, for, for the cheek of, of, of defending themselves, for, for thinking that they could, they could be an independent country, that they could be a democracy, that they didn't have to surrender to Putin. Uh, that's why he's doing it. And it's, it is by its very essence of war crime. So he needs to be indicted tomorrow, frankly, and the United States needs to support that as we can under our law. There was a unanimous resolution in the Senate sponsored by Senator Graham said we should support the ICC. They have jurisdiction because the territory of Ukraine is under the ICC, under international law, and, and, and it can be prosecuted there. And then we need to get behind efforts to enforce that order and make sure that sanctions don't come off, that they don't get back into the international banking system, that they don't get their $300 billion worth of assets that are frozen in New York. They don't get any of that back until they comply with international law. Definitely needs to be done. I will say something else because it's come up a lot and it confuses people, but there is a need to do something on aggression too. Uh, the ICC has jurisdiction of the war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, but not of aggression. The thing that outraged the whole world about this and why we get these votes of 143 in the, in the UN is here people living peacefully, going to work and school and everything else, and then suddenly on the 24th of February, death starts raining from the skies without really any provocation, any attack, any justification whatsoever. Clear violation of the norm that we enforced in Nuremberg against the Nazis, together with the Russians, we enforced it at Nuremberg. And it hasn't been really, we haven't had a situation like this since. The international community of Ukraine would like to see it. Uh, on Monday night, the, the, left, uh, the Baltic countries called for it. We need to have a special tribunal established uh, between an international body and Ukraine to try the crime of aggression that potentially could also deal with the issue of reparations, etc. Because after all, not all of the crimes or not all of the deaths, not all of the destruction is war crimes. Some of it is what happens in a war. Soldiers are killed by other soldiers. But in an aggressive war, those soldiers are victims too. And all the destruction visited on Ukraine is a result of the crime of aggression. So we need to have, uh, we need to uh, get behind efforts to establish that kind of tribunal. We don't need it to prosecute Putin, or it would be easier there because he's definitely made that decision. We heard the speech at midnight on February 24th. But it, it, uh, uh, we've, we've got the proof for that. We also have, I think, a strong proof on the war crimes, and it's necessary to to really bring international law uh, to bear in this situation, not just as an academic exercise, but to do the kind of things that we've done before with Milosevic and Mladic and Karadic, and I indicted Kambanda, the prime minister who led the genocide, and the, we brought him to trial and got life sentence in that situation, Charles Taylor and, and president of Liberia. We've done this kind of thing before. We need to do it in this case if the law is going to matter and if people are going to be protected. Here, here. Uh, Colonel Vindman, same exact question. You have experienced the highest levels of government. What are the tools that the U.S. government and other free and open societies have that we're not using, that we could apply to this problem? What are your suggestions? Well, <clears throat> really, I think accountability will come with victory on the battlefield, ultimately, in this conflict. Mm -hmm. So um, the Ukrainians have done really a magnificent job, uh, overperformed in many regards, uh, just like the Russians have underperformed. And so despite um, overwhelming odds, uh, they, uh, the momentum is on the Ukrainian side. So to enable that victory at a much quicker pace without uh, stretching it out and having additional human suffering, 
uh, providing more weapons. Um, the the high Mars have proven themselves to be critically important. Uh, the next level is attack uh, missiles of much longer range, um, uh, unmanned combat aerial vehicles, uh, probably uh, aviation of some sort, counter drone capabilities, and that's more on the higher end. Frankly, I don't think it's uh, that escalatory. Uh, the, the reluctance comes from uh, really the, the White House, the National Security Council, in my opinion, uh, with a fear of escalation. But the, the Russians have massively escalated, if you think about what they've done uh, in the last month or so. Um, and um, there's got to be a response, a commensurate response from the West. And uh, frankly, I, I think that the risk of, uh, you know, use of a WMD is fairly low at this point. And so um, enabling the Ukrainian victory um, and also then supporting um, the policy and uh, the prosecutions, as the ambassador said, the nice thing about um, criminal international law is um, that uh, unlike Russia is a P5 member, so they have a veto. That means they have been able to avoid accountability um, on the world stage. But um, they can't avoid uh, accountability under criminal international law. So whether they like it or not, they are subject to um, jurisdiction uh, either under the International Criminal Court or uh, Ukrainian National Courts or some other body, and they can be prosecuted. And the Ukrainians have taken the first steps in doing that. They've prosecuted at the lower level. And they're looking at raising cases of command responsibility up the chain. That is another area where we can enable them, uh, help them draw the appropriate linkages. And um, I think that if we if we do if we act with um, grit and determination, and not uh, not be dissuaded, uh, then um, the Ukrainians will win, and that's when you'll get accountability. Excellent. Moi, same question. What tools do we have that we're not using, that we should be using to stop the war crimes, hold the perpetrators accountable? I think that, that there are many tools that we are underutilizing uh, and some that we're not using at all. And I think the number one thing that we need to remember is that this is a, a global fight. I know it sounds cliche of good <clears throat> against evil. This is you know, you look at the uh, at the Russian regime and, and, and its allies, and look at what they're doing in different places, and and you see that those that are standing against them are the same one people that espouse our values, uh, and the same ones that are suffering horrific crimes. Um, I wish Ambassador Rapp would, would run for president in 2024. I can't just day and night. Um, you know, in terms of justice, and I agree with with Alexandra and, and with Colonel Vinman. Um, the fact is. You, you need these people to be able to protect themselves and win this fight in their own homes against an aggressor that has come from a different country supporting horrific war criminals. And that doesn't just apply to Ukraine. Frankly, that also applies to Syria. The people that we've worked in the past with and the people that continue to stand against uh, <coughs> Russian uh, aircrafts that are taking out entire neighborhoods. It was in Syria where, where, where we tried to stop the Russians from bombing, uh, you know, hospitals and in, in the... We even the coordinates were given to the United Nations to say these are the hospitals, don't touch them. They bombed every single one. Just as the Ukrainians have a right to defend themselves, as do the Syrians, and they are not defending just themselves. They are defending democracy. They are defending Western Europe. Um, they are defending. You know, we've seen what's happened when when millions of of, of refugees uh, have had forced to go to Europe, uh, and and how Putin has also used both the energy crisis and the refugee crisis to help. The rise of extreme right-wing parties and divide Europe itself. And so, number one, we need to support uh, uh, these people with anything that we can to defend themselves, especially from aerial attacks. Uh, and as Colonel Vindman said, you know, I think you know Putin's all in. He's escalated. I don't know why sometimes risk aversion can can really stop you know the mission of what we're trying to do. But um, beyond that, when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to normalization. Uh, we need to do more. The Caesar Serious Civilian Protection Act, for example, of 2019, not a single new bundle of sanctions under that act has come under this administration. We hope that will change soon. Um, and as Ambassador Rapp has said, there are so many things that we can do uh, on the accountability side, including where Syrians, thanks to their, you know, the many people that are working on documentation, the incredible work of these organizations that have helped find ways, even without the ICC, 
to, to, to hold war criminals accountable. But that's not just important for justice. It's also important in the overall geopolitical conversation that's happening in, in, in the overall you know, uh, mission to, to end the killing both in Ukraine and Syria and to show Russia that they don't have a, a blank check to do whatever they want to. Thank you, Colonel Vindman. Yeah, just one other thing that we haven't talked about is really, um, you know, there are sanctions and there's more financial accountability. And I think, you know, uh, Putin and the Russian regime have demonstrated they, they don't care at all about the lives of their soldiers. They don't care how many they lose. As long as they think that they're winning, they're happy to mobilize 300,000 uh, um, conscripts, and uh, they're fine with that. But there are hundreds of billions of dollars of seized assets mm. in the United States mm. and even more across uh, the Western world. And so there is a movement afoot now of generating some sort of a unilateral declaration by the United States saying we're going to take these assets and we're going to repurpose them damages an international system but a multilateral approach like that with the eu and and the us uh and other countries i mean we've seen overwhelming support in the general assembly really uh can change and move international law in a really meaningful way where regimes like the russians which are you know kleptocrats uh oligarchs um if they don't understand uh losses based on human life then they will understand losses to their bank accounts. Mm. And I think that sounds a, um, a fantastic mm. message to other regimes that are looking. Peter Murray to Hertz, absolutely. Uh, let's take, let's go to the audience. And I just asked for you to give us your name, uh, your affiliation, if you have one, it's not necessary. And uh, if you have a comment, can you please put it in the form of a question? And uh, we'll start right here. Hi, thank you all so much for speaking. Uh, my name is Eve Sampson. I'm a reporter with Capital News Service. Um, on Monday, a senior military official at the Pentagon said that we assess that Russia has deliberately struck civilian infrastructure and non-military targets with the purpose of needlessly harming civilians and attempting to instill terror among the Ukrainian population elsewhere on the battlefield. Uh, the senior military official stopped short of calling it a war crime. Can you talk about the implications of that? Why are we not, uh, why is our government not out, outright mm. saying these are crimes against humanity or war crimes? Well, that's a great question. I would just note that President Biden did say that there were war crimes and he's in the government. But I, it's, your point is well, well, well made, well made. Who wants to take that one? Uh, I mean, it's, it's yeah. obvious. It's war crimes. <laughs> if, if, if those conditions are met, that, that is the very definition of war crimes. It, intentionally attacking uh, civilian infrastructure, civilian life, et cetera, is a war crime. Do, uh, bombarding in, indiscriminately, like they did in Mariupol, uh, without any distinction between civilian or military targets, or using disproportionate force and not distinguishing between civilian and military targets. Those are war crimes. They're a little harder to prove. This, I think, given the pattern that we've seen, uh, in the last two weeks is 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 a case that approves itself. And so I, I think we we definitely have it. And it's all the more reason why I think we should be working with the with the ICC to get charges at the highest level. Uh, because even when the Ukrainians would like to prosecute Putin, but under international law you can't prosecute the leader of a foreign state or the prime minister or the foreign minister. Those three people while they're in office are exempt. An international court can do it. So that's why we need Mm -hmm. uh, let me just ask very quickly, Colonel Benman, what I think is the core of the question, why the reluctance on the part of these senior military officials to use that term when the president said it, and it seems pretty obvious to anyone, why the hesitancy uh, among some of the well, officials? I, I think there's probably a good reason for it, and the reason is this, is that um, these officials are talking in a factual uh, uh, manner. So they made findings based on the evidence they've collected that these things occurred. Mm. It is a, a call of a different body, Department of State, or some other entity to say, okay, <coughs> based on these findings that mm. we've gathered from the, the U.S. Department of State or uh, U.S. Department of Defense and others, mm. we find that these are war crimes and therefore we're going to indict. So, mm. you know, Mr. Khan, for instance, at the ICC can do that. Mm. There are other folks that can do that. So I think there is some value to somebody... But even the White House guys won't back the president and say, yeah, it's a war crime. That's a separate problem because that's at the policy level and they should be fully backing the president there. But, you know, which is a little bit different than somebody at the Department of Defense sure. making factual statements. Got it. Thank you. Next question, sir, right there. 
Second. Thank you. Yeah, Piotr, um, World Bank, previously Crisis Group. Um, Russia is engaging increasingly where the country that is categorized as a state sponsor of terrorism. Increasingly, the conflict is more interstate and cross border. Um, and there's currently a bill, I think it's 623, that's being proposed by Congress to try and make Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. Now, on one side, there are a lot of pros, and on the other, which I think is more important, there are a lot of cons to doing that. I'm surprised you guys haven't touched upon it, considering well, both Syria is designated as a state sponsor of terrorism as well. So I'd be curious to know the panel's perceptions on that and whether or not it would make any difference in, well, the case of making war crimes happen. Let me start with all the time. What do you think about that? And thank you for your question. I think that it's a time to name the things what they are. Uh, when Russia uh, deliberately destroyed critical civil infrastructure, they tried to push Ukrainian authorities uh, to get political concessions, which Russia wants. So it's blackmailed, it's a terroristic tactics. And like, it's very understandable for each people in Ukraine who now uh, expecting winter without heating electricity and light. Uh, so that's why uh, we strongly believe that Russia has to be recognized as a state sponsor of terrorism, uh, because it also uh, provides the additional tools uh, in uh, legislations uh, how to treat with such kind of country. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Let me just jump in. Uh, under U.S. law, it does have a powerful effect. Uh, uh, we look at these uh, survivors over here, the families of people that have been detained or killed uh, in the Syrian system. Uh, they're suing Syria right now uh, because Syria is a state sponsor of terrorism. It, under U.S. law, if the president's designated the state as a state sponsor of terrorism, as we have Iran, North Korea, and we've had other countries on that list in the past, uh, then we can actually sue the state and if we get a judgment, um, the, the, the victims can claim from the sovereign assets of that state. That is an enorm that was, that's an enormously powerful kind of result. Now, in the Marie Colvin case, if you may remember, with evidence that one of the organizations I was involved in helped develop, she was killed in the battle in Baal Amr in Homs in 2002. It wasn't a crossfire situation. It was an intentional hit of her and the media center the guy who who, who got the, who killed her got a reward from the president's brother, Mahara Saad, head of the fourth division. It was an intentional hit. It was so found in the default judgment in Washington, D.C., in district court, federal district court, there's a $302 million judgment. Now, Syria hasn't had any sovereign assets in the United States for a long time, given, given our relationship with Russia, $300 billion in, in U.S. banks. And, and so there's the potential that if we did that, uh, the victims could uh, rush into U.S. The court if they got uh, you know, a U.S. tie and, and use this particular thing. Some might get a lot of relief. Others might not get very much relief. And I think most people think that we'd be better if we had some sort of claims process where the whole, where the whole claims of all the damages in Ukraine could be assessed against it. But that requires Russia to consent. And we don't think Russia wants to consent to anything. So indeed, as, as a tool to get to that, I think the, the designation as a state sponsor of terrorism is, is an important uh, uh, step. Do keep in mind, that, as I know from being in the interagency where the where Treasury would often be opposed to things like, they were initially opposed to even having the Magnitsky sanctions in the United States. They said people would no longer use U.S. banks. It would eliminate uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, currency as a major uh, uh, trading medium and, and have a profound effect on our economy and our balance and, and the value of the dollar, a lot of other things. So they had all of these kinds of concerns. Fortunately, Congress went ahead and passed the Magnitsky Act, and, and we're using that effectively in a lot of places in the world. But you've got that same kind of opposition, the concern of the unforeseen consequences, to potentially taking 300 billion, enormous amount of money, out of, out of US banks and, and paying it to, to private litigants uh, on the basis of, of dozens of, of lawsuits in the United States. But the precedent is there to do it. And it's one of the ways that I think we could probably open the dialogue come along with the kind of thing that Colonel Kent Vinman was talking about, a more multilateral approach, uh, uh, an approach with uh, judges from a variety of different countries, so it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a process that would look like it was uh, one-sided. But I think at the end of the day, it's gonna be necessary because the damage that's being done to human life 
certainly, but also to this to this entire country, and and now so intentionally, uh, indeed, does mount up into the hundreds of billions of dollars, and be probably exceeds uh, what all the assets that might be available. Thank you. I'll just add my two cents, if that's okay. You know, from my experience covering the issue, this issue of state sponsor of terrorism designation, and this might also apply to the State Department's foreign terrorism organization designation. What every administration will say is that this is done as a legal evaluation a process, but it's always the case, predominantly the case that it's a political decision. We saw this with in the state sponsor of terrorism designation over North Korea, for example, the foreign terrorist organization designation for the MEK. It's always always comes down to the politicians deciding, even though they don't like to admit that. And what that means to me is that in this case, the White House and the Biden administration is not doing that for a very specific reason because they believe it hampers their ability to pursue a diplomatic solution that to end the fighting. And moreover, again, this is reporting that I'm giving you from my conversations with these officials, that removing that designation at some point in the future is a political problem for anyone. Because how are you? Rollback is the problem. The rollback is the problem. Well, she said you can't go back and. Well, you can, as we did with North Korea, but problem. the international security problem in other states like Syria, where Russia is still right. There very relevant national security council. I totally agree with what you said. So I, I, I would just like to add that sort of perspective that ultimately comes down to a political decision, uh, not a legal one. That's my experience reporting on these issues. Last question. Hi, uh, thanks very much, uh, Julian Borger from The Guardian. Um, about one last, uh, Alexander, when you talk about having a special tribunal, uh, particularly for the uh, crime of aggression, what should that look like? I know there was this, this uh, initiative by the foreign minister, Leva and Philip Sands to do something, and now the politics are weighing in. Um, you know, is there something taking shape at the moment, and what should it look like? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, we support the initiative of Ukrainian authorities to create special tribunal of aggression. And uh, you know that uh, it's not only a unity of several countries' efforts, but also has to be an endorsement of uh, some international organization, for, for example, UN or uh, Council of Europe or European Union. But when I tell about international tribunal, I tell about rather another problem. What do I mean? Now we face in Ukraine a situation which I call accountability gap. Uh, three weeks ago, I uh, participated in hearings in uh, Congress uh, together with our general prosecutor, Andrei Kostin, and he told that for current moment, uh, Office of General Prosecutor of Ukraine investigated more than 32,000 criminal proceedings. I'm sure that after these three weeks, the, this number increasing. What does it mean? It means that the Ukrainian legal system is overloaded with an extreme amount of crime. And the International Criminal Court will focus only on several selected cases. So for me, not only as a human rights lawyer, but as a human being who works directly with victims, is a question who will provide justice for the hundreds of thousands of victims of war crimes? So international tribunal on war crime, crimes against humanity and genocide for us is one of the elements of complex justice strategy. How to answer to this question honestly and directly, how to increase the potential of national system to provide justice regardless of who the victims are, the social position of the people, like the type of crimes they were endured, or whether or not international organization and media are interested in their cases. Because life of each person matters. And I think this has to be essential in the 21st century. That's a, a perfect place to conclude. Thank you to all your panel, all the panels for your time and for your service. Can we please give them a round of applause? Thank you all for joining us in person and online. And uh, this concludes this event. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you.